I'm Fathery. This is Dave. I'm Chris. This is Brian. And this is Text Trek. Engage. Welcome back to the Starship Texas for the 72nd installment of the Tex Trek podcast, the home of Star Trek fandom from deep in the heart of Texas, where we talk all about Star Trek old and new. And tonight, Dave and I are again joined by Brian and Chris to discuss Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, or as it is commonly known as, The One with the Whales. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, fondly. Uh, a lot of times that, that sounds like it could be derogatory, but I think, uh, most people dig it. Yeah, I have heard some people kind of dismiss this movie as, like, the silly, campy one, but that's, that's rare. Unlike Five, it's intentionally silly and campy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say it there actually is, works here. There is a breed of science fiction fan that likes the grim dark that re- d- turns their nose up at Star Trek IV. I'm not part of that breed, but they're definitely out there. I've got a touch of that in me, but <laughs> uh, but like you kind of can't deny it when you watch it. No. no. <laughs> but this was my childhood favorite Star Trek movie, and I've... I've mentioned before about how when I when I got into Star Trek movies, I, I kind of rented The Wrath of Khan onward, and uh, you know I wanted I wanted to see the the Kirk crew movies and um, how far the, this, how far were they at the time that you started watching them? They this all six of them were already out. Okay, this would have been, this would have been, no next gen. This would yet, have been though. like ninety four. This would have been when Star Trek Generations was about to come out. Okay, okay. when I was really getting into Star Trek hard, and. The VHS cases at the video store where I was renting them was kind of like my first exposure to them. And the case for Star Trek IV was the one that really looked the most appealing to me. <laughs> and I, I was so curious about, like, why are they in that, that ship? I know that's the Klingon ship, because I've seen, I've seen, like, the toy of the Bird of Prey. And uh, I, I, I was curious what happened in, like, the first two movies. The, I, I assumed it would explain, like, why they end up in a Klingon <laughs> ship. Did it also um, show 20th century but, stuff? Yeah, it, 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 showed, <coughs> it showed them like walking around on, on Earth in modern day. And it also just kind of, it looked like the most modern to me. Mm-hmm. Even like, I mean, at the time, the movie would have only been like eight years old. But this is, this is actually the first Star Trek movie that came out like when I was alive. Right. So maybe, mm-hmm. maybe just because of uh, that, uh, something like in my brain I think, recognized that. I think you saw that headband on Spock and you're like he looks so cool and modern and fresh <laughs> <laughs> yeah because uh, we all were rocking those in like 94 <laughs> when, when I, I was watching this um, but yeah and, and immediately this became my, my favorite Star Trek movie and was was for many years and it wasn't until I was like in my adulthood when I started thinking about maybe people are right about like Wrath of Khan being better I don't know maybe but the, um, it was actually, Dave, it was actually like you pointed out to me, like, there is some stuff in this movie that, that might border a little bit too silly, uh, even though, like, it works for me. I, I think when you compare it to some of the other Star Trek movies, you might you might look at this as, like, a less perfect example of, of a Star Trek movie, but, but I still hold this movie in very high regards. What about y'all? You know, I, I think... In the same way that Star- the original Star Trek could have an episode as serious as the Doomsday Machine or City on the Edge of Forever and, and also do a piece of the action or the Trouble with Tribbles, uh, Trek has room in it for comedy. And so although it, it's never going to quite hit me as, as it be as quite as impactful on me as the more serious ones, as a, as a side diversion, it's a really good... You know, it's like a good comedy episode of the original series. It's they they're good at what they do. So yeah, you could easily say this is cut from the same cloth as the Trouble with Tribbles or uh, a piece of the action. And I should say, Roddenberry didn't like those episodes because he thought it made his his science fiction show look too silly. 
Interesting. So, again, when people say, what would Roddenberry think? I, I, I say to you, we should never ask that question about modern Star Trek because Gene Roddenberry disliked a lot of good Star Trek. So that's a very poor <laughs> yeah. litmus test. Right. I think, yeah. I think it's an interesting question to ask sometimes, but you should remember that some of his opinions were going to be nutty. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I consider myself a fan and I definitely enjoyed the revisit. Uh, what about you guys, Chris? Um, I would say I have such fond memories of it. It was the first Star Trek <laughs> movie I saw in the movie. Actually, I saw it at the old village cinema in Anderson before oh, it was the Alamo yeah. Draft House. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I, I remember going and seeing it and loving it. And um, again, like I think Father said in the past, you know, you could objectively say that like Star Trek Two is the best movie, um, and Six is a little more serious, has a little more of the mystery. Mm -hmm. uh, this is probably my favorite. Is uh, it? Yeah, of 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 these, um, just. I, I don't know, just it, just the nostalgia factor for me, I just can't overcome. So, no. Brian? Um, well, when I first got to see it, sometime after seeing three... Um, Did this was, cheer you up? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. It, was, it was like a year or so remind, later. Remind, so. remind everyone your, your I, reaction I think, to Star Trek 3 that you oh, talked uh, about Star last Trek week. Star Trek 3 was... I was just getting into Star Trek. I was a little baby Star Trek fan who'd seen like 10, epi 10 or 15 episodes of the original series. And I, I kind of remembered Star Trek 1 and 2 from watching them before I got into Star Trek. And Star Trek 3 broke me. Kirk's losing his son and then losing the Enterprise. And I love the Enterprise. I'd just fallen in love with that ship. And I was, I was bummed for days after I saw Star Trek three. So, so yes, there was something nice about Star Trek four, getting everything back. But I was very, even at that young middle school age, very aware that the Enterprise A was not the old Enterprise. And it was, it was a different Enterprise and a new Enterprise. And that's okay. And it's better than no Enterprise, but it will never be the one that I loved from that 60s show because mm -hmm. the book told me that it was the same one as the 60s show, even though it didn't look like the one from the 60s <laughs> show. Anyway, so that was three. Four, I, I, I thought it was fun. I laughed at the jokes, but I have to admit the complete absence of traditional Starfleetiness that I loved as a kid. That's what drew me in was the ships, the uniforms, the technology, and they're using a Klingon ship. They're not wearing the uniforms. They're not exploring strange new worlds, but bumming around in, in areas that I've seen in other movies. And as a kid, it was okay. I didn't hate it, but it was definitely like, and Spock wore a bathrobe. What, what the heck was that? Bathrobes aren't cool. <laughs> and so Star Trek IV did not do all that much for me, and I rarely revisited it um, as a kid. As an adult, especially in the times we live in now, I find that the, the, <laughs> the fun of this movie to be very warming to my soul and I also have to say that this movie takes all the tropes of Star Trek movies and says, screw it, we're going to go hunt for whales and there's not going to be a proper villain and we're not going to have a big space fight and we're not going to do all the other things you expect to do in the film franchise. So looking back on it, I love the guts. I love the daring. And I feel very sad that Star Trek never had the guts to do anything this weird again in its film franchises. Um, they had to so, be riding yes. a little bit high after Trek 2 and 3 had got, done so well for them. So it's grown uh, like, way man. bigger in my in my estimations as an adult. Mm -hmm. yeah. Real quick reflection, but I, I kind of hadn't thought about it as I was rewatching it, but is there any is there any fighting at all in this? There's got to be a punch um, thrown there's, somewhere. There's one act of violent aggression, and that is when the whalers fire a harpoon. Yeah. And, and even that is diverted. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, they point guns at Chekhov. I know, but the, know. The, to be even though like the American military people are, are being assholes to our hero, they just found this Russian on their <laughs> ship pointing yeah. a ray gun yeah. at them. Yeah, no, so I, it's the, all, their actions are totally defensive. No, no, yeah, the, I'm know, not the, saying it's not justified. There, I'm just there's saying only, there's there only some... one specific like act of of like hostile aggression. Yeah, and they don't even do that. That kind of the cliche. I was just. Watching Raiders of the Lost Ark earlier today, and the part where Indy sneaks on board uh, the like the sub, where he's at the German oh, yeah. base near the end, he like knocks out two guards to kind of move forward, steal a uniform. They don't even have it like the traditional knock out a guard thing in this, do they? Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting. Very pacifistic. The, the very only phaser in... discharge was to fry a lock. Yeah, it's yeah. very in line with the kind of 
uh, f- you know, philosophy, the hippie philosophy of the whale saving movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to go on like a uh, Doctor Who tangent mm-hmm. because we're we're joined with like one of the uh, the the most knowledgeable Doctor Who fan I've ever encountered, uh, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, 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 Brian. I'm about to say what? Bri- Brian, the 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 ultimate Whovian over yeah. here. But this is the Doctor Who episode of Star Trek. Absolutely. Yeah. Looking back, I also uh, the the part of me that once I realized what I loved about Doctor Who, I realized I had to love Star Trek more too for the same reasons. But, uh, it takes things that do not belong together and puts them together, which is mm-hmm. the essence of Doctor Who. And also, just like the way it uses time travel, or yeah. the the way that you know you have the. The fish out of water and and walking around on contemporary Earth and the the, the like the, the strong uh, pacifism of, yeah. of the movie pacifism yeah. humanistic band um, yeah if yeah. this script had been rejected and they wanted to make a Doctor Who movie this script could have been, the, the basic beats and plot could have been reworked into a hell of yeah. a Doctor Who movie oh, yeah speaking of the beats and plot yeah we we will go ahead and just go over the story of this movie very quickly and refresh. Any of you who might not recall this one that well, uh, we will engage the transwarp summary. So, Spock is alive, the Enterprise is destroyed, and the crew are wanted criminals. They depart from planet Vulcan on their stolen Klingon bird of prey to turn themselves into the Federation authorities. When they arrive at Earth, however, they find that the planet is being assaulted by a giant probe. Again. See Star Trek The Motion Picture for more. (laughs) <laughs> the probe has neutralized the power systems of space dock and all the local ships. It keeps making weird sonar-ish sounds directed at Earth's oceans. No one's sure what's going on. Uh, but the probe is also causing stormy and destructive weather across the planet's surface, putting the entire world in jeopardy. Luckily, Spock determines the probe is actually trying to communicate in well songs. Humpback wells, to be specific. Uh, maybe some humpbacks would be able to communicate with the probe, but humpback wells have been extinct on Earth for centuries. The only remaining option is to calculate time warp, then slingshot the ship around the sun and go back in time. The crew pull this off, then appear in modern day, or I guess I should say 1986, <laughs> Earth. They park the ship in San Francisco and go on a comedic, fish out of water adventure to find a pair of humpback whales, construct a tank to transport them, and recharge the ship's dilithium crystals. Lighthearted, fun, and comedic hijinks ensue, uh, but they are able to accomplish the mission as well as recruit 20th century Earth marine biologist and whale enthusiast Jillian Taylor. They return to 23rd century Earth with both a pair of whales and Dr. Taylor, crash land in San Francisco Bay in the middle of a sea storm, and release both whales into the water. The whales sing to the probe, and the probe apparently decides everything is cool, and it takes off out of the solar system. The weather goes back to normal, all the ships in space get power back, and the whole crew receive pardons for their crimes from Star Trek III. All except for Admiral Kirk, that is, who receives punishment in the form of a demotion back to captain. Hmm. And he is assigned command of a new Starship Enterprise. Anyone who watched the previous Trek movies can tell you this is actually a dream come true for Kirk, who wanted nothing more than to be back in the captain's chair. And like that, we have restored the status quo of the original series, with Kirk as captain of the Enterprise and everyone back on the same ship. The end. So Chekhov's career is kind of in the tank. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I mean, to be fair, he probably had to undergo some stuff after the, the bug thing. You could retcon it, perhaps rather cynically, and say no other starship captain wanted him as their first officer after they after his stint, what he did in Star <laughs> Trek Three. But Kirk was like, I, you're fine with me. I yeah. absolutely will put you, make you a you department know, head. <laughs> arguably in Star Trek II, he also did turn traitorous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I would. I feel that's a very unfair to hold that against <laughs> him. I don't know what's, what's, what are the long-term effects of Seti Eels, though. Maybe maybe occasionally he like gets the urge to uh, to kill Admiral Kirk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I do love how the movies weren't afraid to shake things up and, you know, change things. Even even starting off with the motion picture with Kirk as an admiral. 
Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And it, even though I love this movie, and I even love the ending, it is kind of weird to undo all of that and go back to the original series status yeah. quo. Well, I, I understand why you would do that. Just it's You're going to make more Star Trek movies. You know, you don't want to have to have explanations of why is Kirk in command? Why is everyone back on the same yeah. ship? Yeah. And it is also just the crowd pleaseriest thing you can do for for the for sort of general audiences who just want to see these characters together and don't worry too much about how it all yeah. fits canonically. But yeah. I, I think like those conversations are best saved for when we get into Star Trek Five and Six, where we actually see well, that status quo in action. Yeah, well, I do want to say Star Trek Four is kind of the last big hurrah for Star Trek being this new changing, evolving <laughs> thing. Because by the time 5 comes along, we've got the next generation, and that's yeah. the new cutting edge of Star Trek. And and everything for after 4, the, the Star Trek 5, Star Trek 6, uh, even what we see of them in Generations, is all very heavily influenced by the fact that this is not the new Trek. This is not the cutting edge of Trek. This is this is the nostalgia track. This is back to those old guys that you love so much. This is mm. the greatest hits track. This, and this is the last time we see Kirk and Spock, and they're not supposed to be set in the past. Yeah, you know when when we get to Star Trek Five, you know TNG was already in, to its second season. Yeah, so yeah. it's like yeah. So this is almost like a a prequel to the to the the actual modern. Yes, Star Trek. yes, and and Star Trek Six feels very much like a prequel to what we to <laughs> the next generation to the point that um, they reference things from the next generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is kind of the last time that Star Trek. <laughs> Was free to do the the future was a wide open slate and they could do whatever they wanted with it and there was no the limits. Fu- the future is a wide open slate. Let's go to the past. I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But well, just by doing that, they're they're still showing that we we can do whatever we want with this yeah, series. Right. We can we can blow up the Enterprise. We can have them have an episode on a bird of prey. After that, we want the crazy, the new weird stuff to be in the next generation. We want. To, a certain formula. We want a nostalgic kick. Huh. We want the greatest hits when we go look to Kirk and the, his gang. We want that again. And uh, at least that's how they play it, I think, with five and six and generations um, is kind of that, that, that it's very much, it changes the whole tone of things after this. Hmm. And uh, so I kind of think that even if they hadn't put them all back on the same ship at the end of Star Trek four, that's probably where we would have ended up by with on five. Hmm, <laughs> Because that's kind of, I think that's what people, they felt that, that that's what we, we have to offer. We have to offer that old gang on the old ship doing the old thing um, by the time we get to five and certainly by six. Well, let's just talk about the, the story of this movie in, in bigger detail. I mean, it's just like the, the basic concept of all, of like the probe coming to Earth. Um, one thing that does frustrate me is it is extremely similar to what happened in the motion picture. And I do, I do hate uh, derivativeness. I, I like the fact that it's the same because it goes in such, it takes such a huge left turn. And but, actually, it was never a thing that bothered me. Yeah, yeah it never bothered me either. By setting, they set it up to be the same. They even have a cloud at the beginning. You know, the <laughs> opening shot yeah. has a nebula. It doesn't turn out to be part of the threat, but it is. You do see the threat coming out of a cloud. Um, but because they take such a huge right turn or left turn or whatever from what Star Trek the motion picture was, I feel that setting it up like that is fine. I, I actually think that that's a nice little gimmick to make you th- Mr. Oh, we're going to get another mo- uh, TMP. Oh, no, we're not. <laughs> you are totally wrong on that. For my purposes, at least, it was also a more immediately engaging probe story mm. than, than TMP. Uh, with kind of immediate dangerous effects to kind of get you into it, mm-hmm. and then a very unexpected direction that turned out to be like uh, this crazy roller coaster ride, the farthest thing from the sort of cerebral explorations of TMP. I mean, imagine a trailer crafted that didn't reveal that they do time travel and go to 1986. <laughs> and then you go to the theater and you think, you, oh, it's going to be some new threat attacking Earth. And then you see this. <laughs> Just imagine how gobsmacked you would have been in the theater if you had no idea that. That's time not how travel. they promoted it. Though. No, I know, I know. But could you imagine that? That would have. Been I can't just... imagine that because that is exactly what happened with with me in Star Trek: First Contact. Oh, uh, okay. I saw that. Oh, all right. no idea that there was going to be time travel. Oh, in that okay. Movie. Well, there you go. So you got to experience um, that. So. Yeah, but <laughs> nice. I, I I think we can probably all agree that uh, three is the limit. For Star Trek stories of a probe coming to Earth, and the, the the secret to the probe is something from Earth's past. Like I uh, could do a fourth. 
<laughs> uh, I think I think three is enough. Yeah. Which three I, are we talking about? Nomad, V'ger, and the Voyage Home. Was Nomad headed to Earth? Uh, it, it did actually say in the change lane, it did say at one point that it was going to go to Earth and sterilize the planet. Oh, all right. <laughs> to be fair. I don't usually think of it in that context. I don't think they're going to go back to it. No. <laughs> Never know. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Uh, the mad, they... revenged, obsessed people going to Earth to destroy it is the new thing. That's that, what we that, do. That now. new Picard show, <laughs> or maybe, <laughs> or maybe they'll uh, they'll they'll manage to make another Kelvin movie and they'll have them. They'll they'll do their version of the whale story. <laughs> but th- this is this is my this is my favorite that. use of the the probe coming to Earth trope, and we need something from the past to to deal with it. Uh, just real quick on a purely visual level, I think the probe is a really cool design in its yeah. simplicity and its sort of. Almost harkens back to like the the black monolith from two thousand one, mm-hmm. but it's so much more giant. There's a sort of marbleish texture around it. It has the weird. It's very alien, and then it's got that beam that looks like it's got like a uh, growing embryonic cell mm-hmm. uh, giant. Yeah, thing yeah. In it. it's a big cylinder with a, a volleyball on a tractor beam, yeah, and it, it makes like that really cool sound. It does. I, but you could see them doing in a sci fi movie today. That probe would still work. Yeah, they could release no, that. I, it would I, be I like done with probe. CGI, but it would I, absolutely work. I, I like. I, I really appreciate minimalism, and whenever uh, you you can do uh, a lot with very little, um, I'm very much a believer in uh, you know t- that kind of approach. And uh, I, I I think the the probe works fine. The uh, sound that it makes, Dave, you've said something interesting to me. I, I think it's interesting. Um. That uh, the sound really creeps you out because it reminds you of uh, Body Snatchers. Yeah, yeah, the 1970s remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which used as a background sound for when the uh, the sort of pod people were growing, uh, of like a sonogram sound. Uh, the the mm. kind of eeriness. They clearly wanted to get to that eeriness of birth, uh, and like through that specific technology. And and there's there's definitely like the whale cries, the weird distorted whale cries too, which are also very disconcerting. But it's got that background like thrumming that's yeah. sonogram. Yeah, it is beautiful sound. Yeah, work. and yeah. I, I never knew that was what sonogram sounded like until you told me. Uh, but the the sound it never it never came off as like particularly uh, malicious to me. Um, and I don't I don't know if it's just because I've seen the movie so many times, <laughs> but I I, I want to say that when I watched it the first time, I never thought of this probe as being. Um, specifically uh, hostile. I, I, th- I think oh, in the back of my head, I was thinking that it might have been like kind of like a uh, just like this unknown alien, and maybe like a misunderstanding why it's interfering with all these ships. I guess for me, it conveyed a very Doctor Who sense of the unknown, mm-hmm. which could be hostile or maybe not, or we just don't know. But that mm-hmm. is a sound of unearthliness. You know, that is the sound of lack of context. I think that's that's a that's a good way to put it. Uh, the, the shrieks it makes, it just occurred to me, are not unlike the alien shrieks in the uh, the xenomorph aliens from the movie. In, in, oh, in yeah. Aliens, in the, in the second movie? Yeah, 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 that's what I'm thinking mm-hmm. of. Um, yeah, I, I can I can see it, or hear it, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I for sure felt like, I don't know if I would say malicious, but it, it created this sense of like, I mean, those are like, when you hear animals make those kind of sounds, they're trying to make you go away, you're in danger. Yeah. So, so like on a, mm-hmm. just a primal level, it's threatening. Like, I don't know if I'd say evil, threatening though, for sure. Hmm. And it also does kind of foreshadow what's going on, because it does kind of sound like an underwater sonar, aquatic mm-hmm. animal type noise. It's actually kind of one of the first that kind of neat thing reveals in the movie when they, uh, when they, uh, who, who is it? Spock who determines that it's the it's the they, they checks to see what it would sound like underwater. Um, I think it's uh, Kirk who suggests that because it was it was Uhura it, figures out the signals being sent to the ocean, yeah, and, and not then, to the land. Uh, and, then, and, then, and then Kirk, Kirk says, says "We'll play what it would sound like underwater." Yeah, yeah. And then Spock is like, "Oh, I'm gonna go run a computer." I know what check. that sounds like. I've yeah. heard that before. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go find the animal that sounds like yeah. that. Well, Apparently, quick... Savick really updated the database on the bird of prey because I can't believe. Animals that went extinct 200 years ago is part of the standard Klingon programming on a Scout class vessel <laughs> they, on their enemy's planet. They right? downloaded a Federation patch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure Sav and, and Spock was training, so I, I feel it was probably Savick who said, "We're going to put give you some proper memory files in your in your computer." Just in case you need to know, yeah, what extinct animal sounded like. Here, here's Encyclopedia <laughs> Galactica. And, yeah, yeah. And let's, yeah let's let's talk about like the Galactica. Galacto political stage at this point, where we're we're still 
uh, feeling the fallout of, of the Genesis device. Yes. Yeah, there's a there's a Kling is it the Klingon ambassador? Yes. Yeah. Yes. He's like peddling like what would kind of be a conspiracy theory. And in this case, maybe not the craziest conspiracy theory, because there's so much unknown about the Genesis device, and has been mm. used or intent to, use, <clears throat> to be used as a weapon has happened. Mm. Uh, but yeah, he's like, this is all a Federation plot, and Kirk is behind it, you know, he's, um, they they have, like, uh, figured out their Genesis pizza Genesis was an inside job. Jesse, yeah. that's exactly right. He's the Alex Jones of Klingons. Oh. <laughs> He's got an InfoWars t-shirt on. I love that someone calls yells out to him pompous ass and <laughs> calls him calls him a pompous ass. And then like in one of the uh Star Trek novels, I think it's uh actually Star Trek Sarek, which is set right after Star Trek 6. But in that book, uh there's a Klingon ambassador and it describes him in the book as a pompous ass and I was like, "Oh, it's that guy." <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I picture him as also being the guy who uh, Krug reference, references in Star Trek Three when he says, uh, you know, while, while our emissaries negotiate for peace. Yeah. Um, it does feel like that 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 whole guy was inspired by that one line from Star Trek Three. It, it makes me wonder with like these tensions uh, increasing between the Klingons and the Federation and Star Trek Three and Four, and then we, we see where it goes in Star Trek Six. It makes me wonder what happened to the Organians. I know, I know the novels oh. mention that, but um, I kind of don't like the way that the novels handle it because to me, it, it kind of feels like the Organians must have gone away at some point prior to Star Trek Three. But um, yeah, it's weird. Uh, so yeah, d- Chris, you know the deal with the Organians? I do not. So well, one of the quintessential Klingon episodes of the original series. Uh, their vi- the Enterprise and the... It was the or, first one, wasn't it? Uh, yes. Was it? yes. Yeah, oh, okay. Starfleet and... Um, uh, Aaron the of Mercy. Klingons are vying for control of this planet mm-hmm. of what seems like primitive people, but will be revealed to be these godlike aliens, the Organians, in the end, who, like, make them stop fighting with, like, powers that can they can just, like, with a wave of a hand, godlike Q powers make them, like, what, all their weapons turn hot yeah. or something but like basically, that? But basically, they make it where, like, the Klingons and the Federation can't... They force a, treaty, a peace treaty, and, oh, yeah. okay. not just on that one planet, but like a you know an entire peace yeah. treaty between the two empires, okay. or two governments. Um, and so, yeah, and, and it's like at no point does anybody ever say they stop doing that, but clearly at some point they stop doing yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> and they've referenced the Organians peace treaty again in what Trouble with Tribbles, I think, or something. Yes, yeah. Uh, so it, it comes up. A, it's, it's basically why they're not at war with the Klingons in TOS era. Yeah. yeah. Um, incidentally, I wanted to mention that the Klingon ambassador says something that has a line that I like. Uh, he says, uh, when Sarek defends them, he says, Vulcans are well known as the intellectual puppets of the Federation. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, that's a, that's a pretty good, harsh, you know, bad guy assessment of the Vulcans. <laughs> well, they're kind of being racist to each other, because Sarek starts off saying, uh, well, Klingon justice is, what does he say, it's like a particularly interesting point of view, or so, something kind of yeah, dismissive yeah. of, of yeah. Klingon justice. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, and that you could goes argue that, that he's referring to their culture rather than their race, but with, with but it does, you know, Trek but, has always done that weird thing where you know a cultures tend to be monolithic. So yeah. if most of the bad guys are, are, are like most of the examples we see of a culture are bad guys, they're a bad guy culture. Yeah. <laughs> so the movies were still running with a little bit of that, even as they tried to get a bit more nuanced as time went I, on. I just like seeing like the politics of Star Trek be addressed. Yeah. And, yeah. It's not too often you see that sort of galactic perspective that you see what the we see the Federation president. Can, yeah. can, can we assume that the lack of mention of Genesis in five and six means that they eventually managed to convince the Klingons and other powers that, yeah, uh, David's dead. The other scientists are dead. The planet blew up. We're not going to build another one. Mark uh, Carol Marcus is the only one who might be able to pull it off, and I'm sure she's in a, in the in the Fracno kind of category we're, at this. We're point. We're never going to see her again, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, can we? Is that the best assumption for why Genesis doesn't uh, end up being so. an issue? And they probably going forward? Should, they probably should have dropped it when they did because it would kind of feel like beating a, a dead horse. If well, they... no, but they never explain why they yeah. drop it. Is all my is my point? But uh, and I was just like, is that the best assumption from? Is that all your head guys' head? Canon. Yeah, that, that sounds about yeah. right. Essentially, it, it simmered down. Yeah. <laughs> and we also get to see uh, Planet Vulcan again. Mm-hmm. So this is the third time we've seen Vulcan in a, in one of the movies. Mm. So they they frequently go go to Vulcan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. There's a memorable scene pre takeoff uh, where they've uh, painted up the uh, Klingon bird of prey to make it a little bit more their own. 
they rename it the HMS Bounty, a, mm-hmm. a ship which had a famous mutiny. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and we also have Amanda Grayson making her um, second appearance as the character after the original series Journey to Babel. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we have Spock doing that that computer quiz program yes. where he's got to answer all those questions rapidly. Which kind of became a canonical type yeah. of thing. They, they brought it back in Star Trek 09 and they brought yeah. it back in uh, Discovery Season 1. We see Michael Burnham in one of those. Yeah. So this is how Vulcan kids, I guess, are educated. So Spock is, is kind of re-educating himself. You have to listen to a high-pitched computer just bounce a thousand questions a minute at you. Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> But, uh, but she throws him off by... Or actually, I guess she the, doesn't the com- throw him the off. Computer the computer asks him, how does he feel? Yeah. So we set up the Spock arc of this movie where he's he's basically... My interpretation of it's always been he's he's reset to original series Spock. He, he's lost like some of like that, that growth that he's, he's kind of had over the movies where he kind of learned to like balance his, his human side and his Vulcan side. Um, so oh, that's the kind of thing that only mind melding with a whale will get you back. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. The the um, again, I, I think it's it's cool that they're they're doing stuff like this. As as we mentioned last week, uh, Brian brought up that it's good that they they took like a whole movie to resurrect Spock, and you know you you, you want like that death in the Wrath of Khan to feel like it has like weight and consequence. <laughs> So I, I like that it still takes Star Trek Four, another movie, to still get him back to where he was in Star Trek Two, and to get the crew back from everything they did in Star Trek Three, as yeah. well. Uh, yeah. If they just, oh well, you, you're a cool guy, so we're not going to press charges. Here's a new starship. That would have sucked. Do you think so. if this were released nowadays, the internet would be like, "Can we please get on into some new territory and mm-hmm. stop talking about Genesis?" And uh, I'm sure some people would be in that <laughs> yeah. category. I'm yeah. so I'm sure. tired of Genesis. Yeah, it's. Clearly, some liberal conspiracy, and it's morally <laughs> written, and there's no bad good science. Remember when Star Trek had real science? And <laughs> yeah, like uh, never. Yeah, <laughs> like Star Trek had real science. Uh, oh, another cool thing that I'm going to use to tie this into Discovery is Spock does mention the Klingon mummification glyph in that that quiz, and we do see uh, Klingon sarcophagi in Discovery. So, yeah. ah, a so casual cool. line which links them up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Meyer yeah. line becomes super cannon. Yeah, yeah and then um, the the crew returning to Earth and uh, having to uh, g- make the calculations to go back in time. Uh, I love that that really awesome moment with um, Spock and Kirk, kind of like uh, hammering out the plan. And when McCoy figures out what they're they're talking about time travel and his oh, reaction, yeah. that's like, now wait a damn minute, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wait a damn minute, yeah, yeah. that is a Probably the best joke. My favorite joke in the whole movie is when McCoy suddenly clicks. Wait, 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 wait! You're no. <laughs> and and yeah. they, they do some some cool McCoy Spock stuff here, where mm-hmm. uh, McCoy, you know, he did establish that affection for Spock in Star Trek Three when he mm-hmm. when he told him, you know, this has to work. I can't stand to lose you again. And mm-hmm. you know, he 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 carried the man's soul. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And. Here you see him get frustrated and annoyed yeah. at him again. Yeah, yeah because yeah. Spock goes back to like how he was in the original series. He's just like at out. He's like, "What do you mean, fill my shoes? What are you? Is this some stupid human thing you're talking about?" And, <laughs> and this is like so frustrating to McCoy. That like yeah. we 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 had this moment, man. We 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 really yeah. came together. Now like we're going back to how we used to talk to each other twenty years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not even sure if it's quite. It's more like talking to Data, really. Whereas yeah. there's the, Kirk and uh, Spock and McCoy actually would aggressively go after each other. I don't think this Spock is aggressively going after anybody. He's That's still true. figuring it out. You know? Well, you know, um, it is kind of data-esque when he doesn't understand curse words and he's he's just uh, saying the hell in front of everything. Yeah, yes. yeah. But it's the very, hell I did. It's but, very funny, though. Yeah, because yes, it's, 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 it's got comic timing. The delivery is you know, excellent. They, I will also say about the time travel thing, yeah. the idea that we go from... Oh, is transmitting whale calls to the planet and kind of trying to destroy the planet to, all right, we're going back in time now. That is like so Star Trek Discovery. <laughs> that is so, boom, we just got to get on with this plot. We're yeah. not going to have a big conference meeting or Hike talk about agrees, which It's gonna, a good idea. Just go. It, just go. Go. <laughs> you know, this felt exactly like a Star Trek Discovery moment. That, that is a frustration <laughs> of mine as they, 
they do make it a little too convenient to go back in time. Like it, it, technically, it should be or, harder than this. or discussion or character discussion. Uh, I'll, I'll say both, but just, well, just technically, you, I, I, the way I wish they had handled it was they said, "Oh, because this this probe is sending out some type of wave that 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 interrupts with uh, space time, we will be able to like uh, tear a hole in space time and go back in time." Uh, but the probe can, can't create its own solution. Yeah. Well, no, it's just like because it's around, it, 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 yeah. it's it's brought See, its secret ingredient to going back in time. My my head is that the that that they they the these slingshotting around a star is incredibly tricky, incredibly dangerous. You can really only perform it if you've got Spock. And and it's only that they have Spock on board. And even then, it trashes their machine. They don't know exactly what year they've arrived at. They, they just, well, we aimed for roughly the end of the 20th century. It's not precise at all. It breaks their ship. And, and, and in my mind, at least, you can only do this if you have something like Spock on board. That some other science officer wouldn't even be a... Spock was there when they accidentally did it. He came yeah. up with that and that then, intermixed formula that caused the time travel in the, uh, the, the one where everyone acted drunk um you know spock's the yeah, expert the, in this particular field in the the naked time naked yeah time. naked Which, time yeah to me like i in my head canon i always assumed that like they had figured out how to do time travel in that episode and they actually do it intentionally because they go back in time and uh assignment earth yeah that's the one that feels too casual and, for me <laughs> well i think i think it might have like took a while before starfleet got like really strict on the on the temporal prime directive I suppose um, there could have been some crazy admiral who said, "Yeah, let's investigate that." But this is also the the movie that moves kind of at like it's you want to get to the meat of the thing, which is the culture shock stuff. Yeah, yeah. And and they they do set up that it looks like things are pretty bad on Earth. Uh, you know, they the the weather disaster stuff is <coughs> like has the you have the Federation president in a room where windows are blowing out, and so it looks like he's he could be moments from death. The president sucks, by the way. He is the J.T. Esteban of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice call back to your whiny rant from last week. Yeah. What what did the president do wrong? Well, he just, <laughs> he just comes off as super lame and impotent, yes. just so our heroes can look cool. Like he's basically that's how everybody who outranks the heroes like, look in every movie. He, he's basically <laughs> he's basically there on on Earth just so Sarek can look cool. And like who the, doesn't want a cool Sarek? It's, it's, it's so it's hammy. Sarek doesn't need anyone. To look cool. it, it, it's so, <laughs> I can't believe there's hamminess in this movie. It's, it's, it's when a time um, travel movie when Sarek says, um, it is difficult to respond when one does not understand the question. And the way that the president just looks at him like, oh, like, like, I'm really dumb and you're really wise. I should listen to you. <laughs> and then Sarek is like, you know, you might want to send out a distress call while you still have oh, time. Right. It's, it's like, well, this president doesn't know how to do anything. Well, what he's, the president sends out is not a distress call. It's a keep the hell away call, which yeah, is not yeah. that. That's, he does the, something very different than what Sarek well, suggests. It's, it's going to be distress for you if you come here. Yeah. <laughs> so back the well, hell up. And by the way, you know, when they're in the little Starfleet uh, office there and water is getting everywhere, the, the way they have all these screens and they're looking at the data, the only way in, uh, was it the 23rd century? to get rid of this moisture is they have just like random rags out and they're just like wiping it off. They don't have any... <laughs> uh, that, that didn't bother me. It, 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 it didn't bother it me either. You're just thinking that the consoles probably would like instantly just evaporate it and clear uh, yeah. themselves. I, yes. think, I think I'm more bothered by the fact those are so obvious CRT monitors. But uh, uh, Again, that's a very trivial minor nitpick. I will say, since we have to go, uh, go there sooner or later, in the novelization there's a moment <laughs> where the president is... Is, is watching Kirk with the static-filled thing, and we're going to attempt to time travel it. The president's like, Kirk has been ordered to come, and uh, or, 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 Kirk has been ordered to s stay away, and so he comes, because that's who Kirk is. I, that's a paraphrase. It's much more poetic and brilliant in the novel. Mm -hmm. But I remember thinking, that's an awesome moment where the president realizes just how awesome Kirk yeah. is. Yeah, no, that is who it, Kirk it, is. He's a criminal, and we told him to stay away because he's going to die. So what's he going to do? He's coming to save us. Uh, and it was awesome. <laughs> in, in those uh, Starfleet headquarters sequences, we also see uh, Dr. Chapel yes. mm -hmm. and whatever Rand is. Yeah. Lieutenant Commander, hell, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But she's wearing a cadet uniform, so explain that one to her. <laughs> or an enlisted but, uniform, we'll, I think. We'll, we'll just say way. <laughs> Janice Rand. Yeah, Janice and, Rand. And Christine Chapel. So good yeah. to see them again. Yes. The, the last um, last appearance of uh, Dr. Chapel. Yeah. 
because when we see uh, Major Barrett next, she is Luxana Troy. That's yes. Right. Yeah. Well, I have to admit, if you have a choice between being Luxana Troy and being Doctor Chapel, take Luxana Troy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that is Dave's favorite Star Trek character. Yeah. <laughs> he said jokingly. Oh, uh, but look, I made some. I made some peace with it uh, as I as I've rethought it. Uh, real quick aside, bro, just prior when the probe, uh, there, there's one ship that it like wrecks. Uh, the Saratoga, the, yeah. Saratoga, and, and the Yorktown. And is the, the Saratoga? Is it a female black captain? Yes, yes the first yeah. woman captain in Star Trek. That we've seen. Yeah, and <laughs> Lord knows I hope they were out there and they just didn't get well, shot. I think well, chronologically, yeah. the, the, there is a captain in Enterprise on the Columbia yeah, right. um, yes. who, who was a woman, so I guess she was the first in chronological order. But in, right, but we're talking... In yeah. release order, this is the first one. Yeah. Who a lot of people used to theorize that maybe that would be an older Michael Burnham from Star Trek Discovery. Hmm. Which oh, because they that don't was, give her a name? <laughs> well, yeah, but I thought that was dumb to be like... I mean, there's more than one black lady in Star Trek, <laughs> yeah. y'all, so... You know how Are you sure it's not works. just a, an alternate timeline version of Uhura? <laughs> I mean, that's another possibility. Yeah. <laughs> like, I would uh, like to think there are many diverse captains in Star yeah. in Starfleet. But it is a step but, that this took, which is a small I, I thing, but a nice like thing. I do like to imagine that she's the ancestor of Geordi LaForge somehow. <laughs> why, why do all the black people have to be related? No, no, because it's the same actress. Oh yeah, she plays Jordy's, Jordy's mom. mom. So this could be Jordy's great grandmother, and the genetic that would explain, you know, the well, genetic well, appearance. Speaking of, of actors being reused, so it's only because it's the same <laughs> yeah. actor that I I feel that way. Uh, but, uh, th- this movie also introduces us to Admiral Cartwright. Yes, mm-hmm. who will go on to appear in Star Trek Six. And mm-hmm. Cartwright might be somehow related to the Cisco line. Yeah, right? because he's played by a. a Brock, Brock Peters, Peters, Brock yes. Peters, who will play uh, Ben Sisko's father in Deep Space Nine. Yes, and uh, one of my favorite um, recurring characters in that sh- in that show. Yes, so. but uh, yeah, so they they do a pretty cool job of like showing us um, you know, some people we like in those Starfleet headquarters uh, buildings with uh, Sarek and Chapel and Rand, and so it does kind of up the stakes a little bit, I guess. There's also a whole bunch of background aliens from Doctor yep. Who. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Much better makeup than Doctor Who. <laughs> no, that's, uh, it would be hard to be worse. But, um, <laughs> we, get, we get the ship back in time and they do that, that uh, kind of artsy-fartsy CGI oh, yeah. uh, time travel effect where... You it, see like this like abstract field of like mindscape... Where you see like these ghostly images of the characters, CG versions of their faces, yeah. going through there. It's almost like, I, I mean, if we feel like it would be more like something from Doctor Who or Time Bandits, yeah, well, yeah. Or the motion picture, yeah, yeah. or uh, two thousand one, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. yeah. But I always thought that was a really weird effect as a kid because I guess I was so unused to CGI, mm-hmm. and that was a, the, to me, that's a really good use of CGI when it's something that you can't do practically. It's something that's not supposed to look realistic, anyways. Yeah. Um, so but the cool coolest thing is that it has some audio clips, mm-hmm. lines of dialogue that happened later in the movie. Yeah. So if this is supposed to be like Kirk's dream or whoever is dreaming, it's kind of like the idea of like 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 the time stream like getting into your brain and like yeah, you're, he's yeah. passing through all of these yeah. events on the way to the beginning. <laughs> so yeah, it, but it is trippy. It's it's a thing that they've never ever done since in Star Trek. But, you know, it's kind of fun. I think every time they try do a time travel Star Trek episode, there should be a naked man falling into the water. <laughs> I think all of them should have that, it. That should be the trope. If yeah. I don't see, yeah, porcelain-faced versions of the characters gliding through sp- their heads. <laughs> this isn't realistic. Space. No, I don't care about that. I just want the naked man falling into the water. <laughs> it, has, it, has, it has to cut to, like, some, some reeds in the water <laughs> yeah, for, yeah, for yeah, no yeah. reason. Uh, now, that was the part that kind of confused me as a kid. Like, why, is, why does it show that? Yeah, um, where are those reeds? What is that? Because water? it's showing the stream of time, sir. Yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, the falling man should have been accompanied by a Wilhelm scream. <laughs> <laughs> the one and only time I will accept it. <laughs> you, said wow. you, you said you accepted it in Shazam. I lied. <laughs> <laughs> when it was on the video game. Uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't want to chase that rabbit. Yeah. Um, we... We should talk about the construction of the movie, uh, or the, the script, rather. Yeah, I didn't know this until you mentioned it. Mm-hmm. So, Harv Bennett wrote, like, the first 30 minutes of the movie, and then the the first line written by uh, Nick, Nicholas Meyer, who comes back from Star Trek II, 
is when um, Spock says, judging by the pollution content in the atmosphere, I believe we've arrived in the latter half of the 20th century. So yep. Something like that, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, from there on till we get back to the 23rd century, it's all Nicholas Meyer. And uh, I, I love having the, the screenwriter and director of, of The Wrath of Khan, the very like serious and intense and action-heavy and drama-heavy movie. That guy coming in to do like the, all the lighthearted, yep. jokey stuff in this movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You would not imagine the, that they would have that range and be able to pull off both. But uh, the, the, his one of his other claim to fames in his relatively brief career, I guess, prior to these movies, uh, was the directing the movie Time After Time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In which, uh, what is it, H.G. Wells time travels into the, the present of what, San Francisco again. Or, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, on and is he is he actually chasing Jack, Jack, the, Ripper, Jack the Ripper? Yeah, yeah. yeah. fun movie for, for for those who haven't seen it. Definitely yeah. worth catching. But kind of like almost sort of a romantic comedy adventure, a lighter mm-hmm. outing, and not like super serious. Even though Jack the Ripper is, you know, Jack yeah. the Ripper. And the, the funny thing is that Nicholas Meyer didn't want this to be in San Francisco. He was like, "Can we please put it somewhere else?" Like I already wrote this one time. <laughs> but there, like, Harv Bennett was like, "No, no, no, it has to be San Francisco," and. Um, I, I think that the direction of this movie is also really good. We should talk about uh, Leonard Nimoy. I definitely feel, polished. Definitely yeah. improved. Which makes sense. You're going to learn as you go. Well, he was also more hands-off in this movie. Like Executives didn't really uh, keep the training wheels on him. Yeah. And I, I feel like he's more comfortable doing the more naturalistic type stuff. Like like the, the, the dinner date that Kirk goes on in the movie oh, yeah. is, is like one of the, the best directed scenes here, in my opinion. And he pulls really good performances out of the actors and like those very like, like typical, very like normal real world grounded moments. Um, but uh, Nimoy was also the one who came up with the story of uh, having to go back in time to get an extinct animal and having, having the story really, I, I guess you could say this is the preachiest Star Trek movie but it, it's very much true to form to something that, that, that TOS yeah. had done countless times, and that is uh, you know, a movie that has like a strong, relevant message in it. Yeah, though I, I did notice a reviewer online when I was poking around, looking at what other people had said about the film, pointed out, this is the first time Star Trek addressed our issue. There's no metaphor here. We're literally talking about the whales going extinct. Yep. This is mm. there's no allegory, there's no metaphor, there's no symbolic mapping this they, into twentieth century. They just it is literally we are saving the whales but they, that, that are dying in the twentieth century. It does <laughs> have sci fi consequences, which is the destruction of the earth and oh, the well, yes, oh, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, but I'm just saying that the the, 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 the issue being addressed is <laughs> is not covered up, yeah. not painted over at all, it is not not dressed up as something else. Right. It is not space whales and, but whales. Yes. I, I would say it works as an allegory now accidentally. Uh, with the the issues we currently have with climate change, and the the uh, the sequences of like the the storms destroy or almost destroying the earth, and the the idea of, of we've doomed ourselves because the species has gone extinct. Those things have a lot more relevance and are a lot more frightful now. Than yeah. the first time I yeah, watched this, yeah. yeah, they, I, I, the I, bees were not on the verge of dying out yeah. then. <laughs> For what it's worth, the novelization gets into the probe's head a bit, and it actually says that the probe just, oh, the whales are gone, right? I, I you know, this is a pretty promising world, though. I, I'm going to reboot it. And that's what the probe is trying to do, is ecologically reboot the planet so that some new cool life can evolve here over millions. He's going to reboot it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Try turning it off. So oh. if you're curious, that's what the probe is at. It's not attacking Starfleet or punishing the Federation or anything like that. It's just trying to reboot the planet. This probe hates water. Yeah. <laughs> so. But yeah, so the ship gets back in time. They, they park it in Golden Gate Park. And they, they split up the team into into three different teams. They send uh, Uhura and Chekhov to go get radiation to charge up the crystals. Um, the nuclear vessels. <laughs> Bones, and Scotty. Sulu, and Scotty are on tank duty. They have to go construct a tank. 
And Spock and Kirk go to get the the animals themselves. They they've located two humpback whales located at the aquarium, and th- th- this is when the jokes really start flying. When when they get their comedy like really rolling. Yeah, yes. it's really like the, uh, the 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 multi part mission breakup. Aside from being a tried and true format that works in like everything from superhero comics to I don't know GI Joe cartoons back in the day, it's fun to see the teams break up into smaller units. Uh, and um, I or think like, it just like in works. the RPG games that you run. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna say it also. It it, it 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 in general feels like like any sort of video game RPG where the big mission is broken up into fun smaller missions. Yeah, yeah, it, it works really well when you have like a big ensemble like this. Um, and and this is we get a lot of like comedy gold here. This is where yeah the nuclear vessels when we have a a Russian guy in 1986 ask a police officer. Where's the Navy base? I'm looking for the nuclear vessels. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, were those... Okay, so you may not... I don't know if you know that, but was the police... Was he an actor? Was he a real police officer? There was like, like an actual cop. It the, was. The, and so he just... I mean, he was stone-faced <laughs> the entire time, which made it even funnier. Yeah, yeah, that was like a guy who like they had like on set to like block off... like Or not on set, but on location to, to block off the area they were shooting. Yeah. And so like the actor just comes over and starts talking to him. Yeah. <laughs> And also, the, the, there's a famous story with the woman who says, uh, oh, they're, they're across the bay in Alameda. Um, she was an, an extra on the movie who wasn't supposed to speak. And she was actually working as an extra because somehow, like, the production of the movie, like, messed with her parking. And she, she got, like, a parking ticket or something. And, and they, they agreed to, like, compensate her by letting her be play an extra in the movie. We'll pay you $100 for the parking ticket or whatever. And, um... She wasn't supposed to talk, though, but she's not a working extra. She didn't know that, so she talked to the actor when he talked to her. And uh, because you can only hire um, union actors on this union movie, they had to go, like, get her a SAG card <laughs> and, like, put her in the union so that they could use her line in the movie. Because they liked it. I mean, they yeah. could have just said, we're going to reshoot it. And that person was Angelina Jolie? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, but that's pretty cool for her. I hope she, had, like, was in some way a Trekkie, or at least had a, really, you know a fun if, experience. If anyone out there, and the off chance that anyone out there knows her, like, ask her, like, if she's ever thought about doing, like, uh, conventions, because she could totally, like, get away with that. Like, she she would totally be able, like, there, there are people out there who would, like, give her money for an autograph, and would, like... Go listen to her talk at a Q and A Q&A panel or something. <laughs> yeah, just her story from the movie. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like people with with just as small roles in, in Star Trek have done that before. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah. So we also get the uh, Plexi Corp stuff and the transparent aluminum and mm-hmm. and Scotty not knowing how to use a uh, Macintosh Plus. Yep. Mm-hmm. I mean, it sort of makes sense. It's like how we don't know how to, like, uh, make uh, flint knives and things like that. Um, but this is something that you pointed out to me when you, when you, uh, a, a couple of years ago, when, when you kind of, um, you kind of knocked this movie off of its pedestal for me a little bit. Well, you, you needed to have it knocked. When, when, <laughs> when you said that, uh, him talking into the mouse, like, um, it, it, it kind of feels like a modern day person going back in time and, like, Trying to look for like the the key in the ignition on a on a horse and buggy and <laughs> right right <laughs> yeah. but um just that line the delivery of that line hello computer yeah it, it became iconic it yeah, did I say it quite a bit at work um <laughs> my uh like and not even having seen this movie I mean we rewatched it recently but probably hadn't seen it in ten years and I would still say that line and also uh my uh sister's Alexa goes by computer so they always say hello computer that's to awesome that. yeah so. i've thought about i thought about that if i had an alexa i'd probably yeah. do that yeah you know uh, i'm sure everybody's got favorite lines and i wrote down a few as i was watching it and one of the ones is just one that struck me uh when uh, uh jillian and kirk are going to go out for dinner <laughs> and spock is going to go and just stay at the ship and but as far as she knows she doesn't know what's going on they're just in the park and she asks, he's just going to hang around the bushes while we eat? And, and Kirk is like, it's his way. It's his way! <laughs> <laughs> and there's so many line, just exchanges like that where the timing is perfect. The bit where they're talking about dinner and Kirk and Spock can't get the story straight yeah. is fantastic. Italian, yes, no. Yes. <laughs> I will say no. the the success of this movie combined with the enormous amount of witty dialogue in this movie kind of made it 
so that they felt like they had to cram witty dialogue into every subsequent Star Trek film, and that was not always for the best. Well, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll, point. we'll definitely get to that next week with yeah. uh, Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. We we should talk about uh, the uh, aquarium and in, in meeting Doctor Jillian Taylor, and the, I, I love I love Nimoy and Shatner's. Com- just comedic acting off of one another. You can tell, like, these two guys had a lot of fun, like, offset. They had a lot of fun um, acting together. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nimoy, as a director, I think really understood Shatner's uh, comedy side. And, and, yeah. and, and this this is the first time where we really see Kirk... Uh, he's, he's not, like, kind of, like, almost stuffy, like, uh, stern TOS captain... Uh, this you really see like more like the the Shatner of William Shatner come out in in Star Trek Four, and he he plays Kirk differently after this movie in uh, five and six and Generations. You think he's like a little bit more relaxed? Well, kind nothing of, like, makes yeah. you more relaxed and witty than the death of your son. <laughs> well, I, I think, I think there, he got to. Well, here's the thing: he got to do some normal scenes. He got to have a dinner scene and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I think there might even be some truth to what what Brian was just saying: is that after you've gone through um, Khan showing up, trying to kill you, uh, finding out you have a son, your best friend dying, your your best friend comes back, and only after your ship is destroyed. And the son that you don't really know, you're not even that close to, you just barely got a chance to reconnect with him, but now he's gone. This might really m- make you want to, like, reevaluate how how you live life and, like, your values. And it probably makes him appreciate the people around him a lot more. And mm-hmm. so he does start treating the rest of the crew more like friends or family than he uh, than um, insubordinates. Right. Well, he also... Uh... Oh, you mean subordinates? Or, or subordinates, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but, but And also, they went to bat for him in the biggest way possible in Star Trek III. Yes. Mm-hmm. So so yeah. they literally have, like... Yeah, th- that's could, when they became... would spend the rest of his life trying to pay back the Star Trek III debt. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think, that's a, I think that's a good point. It just, in, you know, perhaps not fully intended to work that way. Uh, it may have just been, yes, Shatner enjoyed playing Kirk like this, and that's just how it went out. But canonically, it kind of fits. He may have yeah. reassessed his life, and he kind of found that he needed to... Be a little bit more down to earth, or you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, and, and like the, a lot of the arcs that these movies create, I know weren't planned, um, but it is cool to see how they actually work. How it can very fit. well. Yes. Um, and the uh, the reactions that Shatner gives when he sees uh, Spock in the tank oh. when the nun oh, says yeah. oh, uh, maybe he's singing to that man and, <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then Shatner how he like his reaction where he's just like oh my god what's going on <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's some great visual humor uh, I, I don't think he quite face palms but it's got that vibe I do think that uh, I, I, what's the name of the actress who plays Jillian uh, Catherine Hicks yes. Catherine Hicks yeah. yeah who was in Seventh Heaven with uh Will Decker himself, Stephen yeah. Collins. Yes. Interesting. I don't know what Seventh Heaven was about. It, is. it was about a uh, preacher... Collecting Star Trek actors. It's about a, a preacher with his wife and their seven kids. Okay. Well, oh, I was going to say... Seventh Heaven. Clever. Uh, so I, I like her in this movie a lot. Mm. She's got some forcefulness that makes her somebody who can just go toe-to-toe with uh, a sort of forceful personality like Shatner by Kirk. And uh, her... Uh, she conveys the character's... Real, like, you know, kind of larger-than-life movie style, but her, her deep and abiding love of the, the the whale she's taken care of for so long. So she gives it the dramatic grounding it needs occasionally so that it's just not all comedy uh, and, like, we just need to get into the future. Like, it's a personal thing for her, and I think she conveys that and br- brings a fair amount to the movie. I would say I like her more than Edith Keller. Um, I like this woman who's, like, more... Yeah, realistic and normal, and not like the Messiah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she also doesn't like like that good heart of you know she has she has very much like a bleeding heart, and she like when she picks up uh, Kirk and Spock when they're you know walking down the sidewalk, mm-hmm. like um, yeah, I just feel sorry for you. You have to walk so far, and uh, she says she has a thing for hard luck cases. A thing for hard luck cases. Yeah, so. yeah, that's why I like the whales, and I love yeah. I love that uh, the scene of the three of them in the truck. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. And oh. how Nimue shot that, where he has like like the master take, where you see all three of them and you see their reactions to one another. Yeah, and it's hard to believe that you would get such a good scene in Star Trek that's three people crammed in a truck. Yeah. But there you go. Now, yeah. I was very surprised to learn Nicholas Meyer's version of the script had her staying behind. Yes, and he had a good reason for it. Yeah, that he didn't want the Star Trek characters of the future to actually come back in time and and fix our problems. They needed to be things that, like, we address ourselves. Right. So she was going to stay behind and fix the problem. You know, not so much that they were going to go to a future where the whales never died out, but that there was going to be this idea that we have a responsibility. And it is weird that the they. Present. It is weird that they bring her in the future, and I get like you know the reason they could be like, oh yeah, we turns out we really need you because you're the only biologist who's actually studied these animals in, in the last uh, two or three hundred years. Yeah. However, um, it, it also kind of feels like they were maybe thinking of using her again in future movies. But like what happened with Carol Marcus, never to be seen again in, in a movie. Yeah. yeah. Or, or in anything uh, canonical. Apparently, if you are a match for Kirk, if you are someone who can go, go toe-to-toe with him as a commanding woman, you gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> it's taking my thunder. Um, so what do you think? Do you think it was better that they brought her or would have been better if they, she'd stayed? I mean, I'm, to, to I'm fine. The good I'm fight. fine with how it worked out, but I understand Nicholas Meyer's reason for wanting to mm-hmm. leave her. I think, I, I think her coming was the best thing for the, uh, coming with them was the best thing for the story, but it wasn't the best thing for the message of the movie. So you have to pick which one of those which is more important. I, so here's the thing. I feel like the message of the movie is going to be conveyed. They showed really gory scenes of whales being cut up. Yeah, it's the goriest Star Trek ever. <laughs> it is. It's, it is. The blood disturbing. and gore is far surpasses anything else. And it's real animals being mutilated. Yeah, but that not well some... meat looks so tasty. I just want to like <laughs> throw it on the grill and cook it up. Uh, honestly, raw, ma- raw meat doesn't do much for me unless it's like... Fish, I guess, but so, yeah, I, thought, I think that I thought it was mouth watering. Yeah. <laughs> Emotionally, like I think it works best that she came to the future. I think that mm-hmm. was a good good bit. Huh. I did want to quick mention you've mentioned all the Star Trek books. I will, um, in addition to endorsing the, at least a few of those books, I yeah. never read the Tra- Trek Four one, but they did do a graphic novel uh, when uh, DC had the uh, Star Trek license, written by Chris Claremont, the notable most notable X Men writer of all time. <laughs> Um, that uh, took place immediately after this and had an adventure that involved uh, uh, Romulans and stuff and uh, had Kirk um, hanging out with uh, Jillian in the future. Uh, a little bit of a, uh, a glimpse of what had become of them. I believe, like the movie, I don't think it necessarily teased a romantic relationship, but like just kind of a deeper friendship. Um, and uh, has a really excellent art by Adam Hughes for those who know that oh, artist. Oh, nice! It's mm-hmm. uh, and anyway, it's called Star Trek: Debt of Honor. So if you get a chance, anybody out there, or if it's available digitally, it's uh, not available digitally. Uh, um, bummer. But I mean, like you might be able to find like a scan or something that you can download illegally. Yeah, eh, you know, if it's not available otherwise, if, if if DC and CBS can't figure out a way to sell it to you, then you might yeah. as well steal it. But uh, the Sequence of, of Chekhov and Uhura having to infiltrate the the CVN-65 Enterprise. Right. So that was an awesome idea. And it, it, as a kid, watching this was also, when I was getting into Star Trek, I was also really getting into the Navy. Mm-hmm. And for, for most of my childhood, I wanted to, uh, to to grow up and join the Navy, which might have actually been a, a better life choice looking back. It would have given me a reason <laughs> to stay in shape. But, um, and... Uh, the the use of that ship I thought was like really cool how like they're they're able to like tie Enterprise into the movie so much that I feel it's kind of unnecessary to have an Enterprise at the end of the movie, but the uh, the, the idea of of yeah this guy is totally a Russian <coughs> spy on our <laughs> ship what the hell's going on see I have to say yes it's funny. And it works for this movie, but Chekhov comes off like an idiot. He does. Scene. He does. And, and it, you can step back and say, do we really want Chekhov to be an idiot? Is that really how we, we want to write him? And, you know, certainly people get blast movies, all the movies and TV shows all the time in Star Trek for not, for writing the characters too dumb and I, they well, should have been smarter. Well, just like when he's talking to the interrogator yeah. who's asking him, um, 
Uh, all right, let's start from the top. And he's just like, the top of what? Yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> not like, Spock. He's not Data. Yeah. He should be able to handle something There's like a that. lot of very broad humor in there. And that's, it's, you know, it's one yeah. of the things that used to irk me more. Now I kind of go with the flow. But, yeah. you know, I, Scotty and, and McCoy scene is also seems a little goof, overly goofy to me. I don't like him being so cavalier about the time travel stuff and giving this guy the invention. Um, I believe, did you say in the book that they make out that the guy definitely did invent Yeah, yeah, Scotty confirms that that is yeah. the inventor of <laughs> that's not Parable. That's not how they play it off in the movie. No. no it's like no. Scotty's like, hell, I, I, maybe he invents it. Who gives a shit? Yeah, yeah it's more like how most <laughs> viewers, the, the a casual viewer What's, would care about time travel and, and paradoxes. Or, or Star Trek Discovery when they, they just uh, move through everything so rapidly. Yeah. They, yeah. They, they don't take time to address don't think about it. stuff like we gotta that. Go. What, what was the name of the woman who walked into the office while they're like trying to solve Madeline? Yeah. yeah. Not, now, like, Madeline. not now, Madeline. <laughs> Poor Madeline. <laughs> I, I used to have a, a girl I, I talked to who a lot of times like she would like message me uh, on, on the phone when like I, I didn't want to when I was busy or something and my, my reaction would always be like not now, Madeline. <laughs> And she but, was like, and she's huh? like, you're weird, dude. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the the uh, Chekhov chase across the the aircraft carrier when it starts playing like the little bit of, of Russian music. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forgot um, about that. We, we should talk about the score here because sure. the the score here is very very unique for the Star Trek movies, uh, composed by Leonard Roseman. The only Star Trek movie he did. I love this music because it's so optimistic and upbeat and it makes me smile and I, I can't hear it and not get like giddy and happy. I yeah. feel like it's got a little bit of a slice of Americana to it. Almost like, <laughs> not, not quite like the soundtrack to The Natural if anybody's ever seen that. I think, did Randy Newman score that? Uh, the Natural? I uh, almost thought he did. It's, um, mm, I don't know. Anyway, um, or some other Newman maybe. Uh, but but the, the, it has that sort of, it's sort of a bigger, like, a, like, it does feel like Americana to me. Yeah. Um, it's, it does, I think it's perfect for this movie. It doesn't quite feel as Star Trek y, but that's okay because this movie doesn't feel as Star Trek y as other yeah. movies. Yeah, it is. I don't know <laughs> if I would hire this guy to do other Star Trek movies, but he was the perfect composer for, for this. this. Well, Some of the music is like bum, 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 yeah. kind of in the opening. Well, and the, all that. The, the main fanfare that it plays in the opening credits, my favorite use of that music outside of this movie was when I was going on vacation on the Star Trek cruise in uh, 2018, and uh, when I was boarding the ship going up the ramp to fi finally uh, get on board, like, that song was playing, uh. which was, like, the perfect song to, like, like energize me, make me feel, like, happy and upbeat. I would have wanted so to hear the Mutara Nebula. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, no, that's that's actually really cool. That was whoever that that's a little that's like an extra mile. I wouldn't have necessarily thought they would have done for those cruises. Yeah, no, that's they, pretty cool. They do a lot of extra miles like that. So I, I strongly uh, recommend the Star Trek cruise, uh, which I plan to go on again if they do one in twenty twenty one. So uh, book that year, and you might see me. Make your plans now. Um, but uh, the the. Idea of having to steal the the radiation, I guess, out of the reactor to recrystallize the dilithium. Uh, I, I like that we can retcon that now and say Spock knew how to recrystallize dilithium because he met Poe in season two of Star Trek Discovery. Yeah, yeah no, that works neatly. <laughs> who, who had the dilithium incubator, yeah. the secret Zahian technology. <laughs> yep. Um, but what I what I love love most about after that when when Trekov is in the hospital. Is, is Dr. McCoy kind of doesn't do as much in this movie as he did in, in, previously, but he does get a big chance to shine in the hospital sequence. Yes. yes. So, do you all want to talk about that? Uh, you know, um, I was listening to the uh, Women at Warp podcast, really, really excellent podcast, and they were talking about how Dr. McCoy has, like, kidney growing pills in his medical bag, yes. a med medicine to simulate death when, in the Amok Time episode. And one of them was like, well, you know, better to have it and not need it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they cracked me up big time. I, I, I tend to think, since we haven't seen kidney growing pills anywhere else in Star oh. Trek, that that might have actually just been a robot kidney that she swallowed that just migrates to wherever it needs to be. Like like system. some expanding nanotech thing? Well, I don't even know if it needs to be any bigger. It might just be really efficient and, and uh, hook up into the so. system. But the, but the idea of like future medicine being so advanced is yeah. pretty cool. I, and and the, his insults about <laughs> modern medicine yeah. were uh, I actually, pretty priceless. Yeah. yeah, although I actually thought that some of that was a little overboard. You know, like, I feel like 
I don't I don't necessarily feel like doctors doing the best they can at the time need to be like called barbarians or whatever. They're they're really trying hard. We medicine is pretty solid in the it in is, the 20th century. Well, but you got to remember Spock's been pissing them off. So he's just <laughs> It is also interesting to see that McCoy always complains about the present with the sort of implied the past was better. The old way of doing things was better. Yeah. He ends up in the past. He's still not happy. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but, but when he actually gets to go back into the, you know, the pat, the, gl- yeah. the golden age. He's not he is, happy. This but is he, not it. What, whatever is golden age is. the original is, series that he doesn't like. He doesn't yeah. like old earth medicine. Yeah, I know. I'm not. I, I just. I probably would have gone the other way with him, and I think the way they did, Nicholas Myers did it was better than what I would have well, done with him. If I had been writing it, I would have taken the easy way out and said, "Ah, oh, Jim, look, you can get real booze, and then you know, blah. Look, they've got horses, and oh, it's great. Yeah. You know, I, I would have know. gone. That I, way. I never saw McCoy in that light. I that that would have seemed weird to me. But Nicholas Myers talked about like his in his mind, like McCoy is like. He's this total, uh, like, uh, bleeding heart, liberal humanist character. Yeah. And I, 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 I always like McCoy, you know, be, be, being portrayed as, like, the most compassionate character. He's certainly, yeah, that is not, he is loaded with compassion, and that is not a conservative and, and that's why, And that's why he would get pissed off at Spock, is because he would see Spock as being cold. Yeah. 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 And I was like, yeah, don't you have any feelings? Yeah. Yes. And yes. he's yes. compassionate to the point of lecturing people. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Shatner also has some good comedy in the hospital when, when McCoy is being a dick to those doctors, and, and Kirk is just like, He's having a bad day. Or, <laughs> or when when he tells like the when they're they're moving the surgeon into the room to lock him up and he, he's just like, Doctor, doctor, such unprofessional behavior. You know, he's like really like playing like this undercover yeah. uh, hospital employee. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, they, they they get Chekhov out of there and then they 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 get the wells and they return to the twenty third century to save the day. And when they when they crash in the water they give uh Kirk, a little action beat where he has to like swim under the water and yeah. hold his breath. In which, some ways, the most action he's seen, other than like the chase sequence with Chekhov does, and stuff. Does anyone here, whenever you're watching like movies and someone has to go like underwater or something, do you ever like hold your breath to see if you can hold it? I as have long done as that. that. <laughs> I have done that. Uh, <laughs> not generally, but the abyss for sure. Yeah. I do think but, for that that the, the whales being inside the ship. It's funny because it's such a simple thing. But I think that's uh, there's some visual grandeur and a real sense of accomplishment when they go through all this work, and you really do see the whales inside this uh, Bird of Price scout ship. It looks really, it looks cool. Yeah, and special effects are pretty good on them. I, yeah. lo- I love when Jillian says, uh, "We have to get them out, or they'll drown." Because like it reminds me, like, oh yeah, like those animals are gonna drown. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're mammals. They gotta, they gotta blow. Yeah, uh, <laughs> George and Gracie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I call him George and Gracie, named after George Burns and Gracie, Gracie and Allen, I think. Is it Gracie Allen? Uh, that sounds right. Let us know if we're wrong. But, um, yeah, that was kind of cute that they named him that. Yeah. But uh, th- this is another cool thing that Nimoy did, is he actu- actually was the first director in, in the Star Trek movies to think about uh, giving Kirk so- some action stuff to do. He had the, the, the Klingon battle. Mm-hmm. On um, mm-hmm. planet Genesis, and then he had them, you know, dive under the water to to pull the lever to open the doors. Yeah, in, a, in such a Gracie pacifistic out. movie, I, I it really makes a lot of sense, and it's clever to have him doing essentially rescue action adventure and not fight action mm-hmm. adventure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, then I I just love it. Like it, I tear up sometimes if I'm like watching this alone. I'm like really engaged in the movie, but. When they they do save the day and the the you know the, the wells have done like their little vertical singing to the probe yeah. and it goes away and so then everyone is like splashing in the water you see like even Spock smiling you see James Duhon just being a big goofy Scotty flopping <laughs> around in the water <laughs> yeah. and, uh, the actors look so happy and the characters look so happy that it makes me so happy to, to, to watch that yes. Some, something about seeing them in a real environment where everybody is soaked which is kind of like innately like kind of exhilarating and comedic and weird well, uh, well any sense <laughs> of formality is just gone there's exactly, no way yeah. to be formal in the situation <laughs> so might as well just express it let it all hang i, I know that know? It, it bugs some people that you see spock smile here and i think it even like bugged me as a kid for a little <laughs> bit but now that i'm thinking about know, like what like the spock arc of this movie is i think i think that smile actually works it's like oh now he's like the spock who has like 
learn to embrace his his human side again. Yes, we are back to yep. Star Trek Two Spock. Yeah, the, and the, a, the, the, I feel we hit that moment when he says, "No, it's the human thing to do with regard to rescuing Chekhov." Yes, that's mm-hmm. the moment where I realized, okay, we've got our Spock back. Yeah, and it's rescuing like something is like like animals is like a really primal. I think uh, you know joy and like sense of accomplishment. Um, I, I don't. Uh, what? I Jesus I Christ! I, I think it's. I like <laughs> movies where the dog dies. I like the movies. I know where that floor to the end of all the other. I, 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 think, I think it's it's weird to like value animal life over human life. Well, this is clearly like, a larger debate. But have you ever helped like, an animal? Like, like, like there's a have raw you ever joy. A human? Yes, I have. <laughs> but like. Uh, it's like when we were talking about like the Wrath of Khan and like Spock's death, and you're like, it's like when you watch a pet. Die. I'm thinking about like, well, oh yeah, it's like when I watched like uh, like uh, loved ones die, or like I saw someone like die in a car accident one time, and like all, all like these human deaths, yeah. and you're like, oh, it's like when you watch your pet die. <laughs> they, um, I've certainly experienced more pet deaths than human deaths in my life. So, um, but my broader point is. That there is, there is a, I, I think something about like saving an animal because they actually are so simple and like, like they kind of know, uh, even though whales are obviously more sophisticated, but there's, uh, they have like they, an innocence. They, they have an, an, what seems like an innate innocence and, and yeah, freeing them sort of has, I, I think, like an, an exhilarating effect. Uh, I haven't personally freed whales before, but, uh, or saved their entire species, but I feel like that'd be like a thing where you would just be like, Goals. giddy. Giddy with joy, and I feel like Spock was appropriate in that. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I know you totally would like swim under there, pull that lever, and, and they have that animals. same energy in Jurassic Park. No, I drown. I can't hold my breath. We have that same energy in Jurassic Park, where they brought back extinct life, and everyone's like just filled with joy and mm-hmm. wonder of it all. And then they get eaten. Oh yeah, they get eaten. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh... um, but I mean, yeah, that's that's pretty much the movie. I guess I guess we end with the what we mentioned earlier yeah. with the um, the award ceremony and and. Restore the status quo, but we oh we also get like that final shot yeah. of of Sarek and Spock that I really like. Oh yeah, I I, I do like is this movie overall. It not only uh, what should I say it not only killed the next generation but brought it to life. There there was this idea of bringing in new actors like David and Savick and slowly phasing out the old actors and creating a new generation of people to continue these films hmm. and that was completely dead by the end of this film. But the success of this movie is what made next generation possible yeah. and kicked that kick started that as a thing. That so, was when, when Paramount was like getting Roddenberry on the phone. Like, we, we need to do a show. Yeah, game. so this is like, yeah, we, we it, it made it, no, we're not just going to keep making movies. We're going to do something completely new because Star Trek is so popular. And there's things that, that you mentioned that kind of bothered you as a kid, how like this wasn't a normal Star Trek movie, how like they're walking around on Earth instead of in starships and, yeah. uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not, they're, they're dealing with very like real world stuff. That is why it had the huge, massive yes. feel. Oh, yes. And was, I was a weird kid. I didn't like the things other people liked. It was, it was, <laughs> this was the first Star Trek movie that performed super well overseas. Yeah. That uh, foreign audiences who weren't as uh, familiar with the original series, like, really embraced. And, and, yeah, like, because of this, we got The Next Generation and all the other spinoff shows. Star Trek uh, might have died off with these original series movies, had this not been a uh, big financial hit that it was. Yes. Mm-hmm. The whales saved us. Yes. Yes, yes, yes they, they did. did actually. And the franchise. <laughs> they saved the franchise. So, so it occurs to me that if you take the three movies together, uh, Wrath of Khan, Search for Spock, and Voyage Home, uh, Wrath of Khan kicks off with a callback to uh, a, a original series episode with Khan, of course, as, as the opening to it. And they, the bookend on this end is a callback to Spock's uh, division with his father seen in Journey to Babel. So yeah. it's kind of a, not very, probably not intentional, I know, but uh, but it does kind of bookend it nicely with some of the issue, so elements of the original series. Yeah, no, and that, if you know all of that lore, the scene where he says, I think you're, you know, I'm kind of okay with you being in Starfleet. Is That's huge. huge. Yeah. It's yeah. huge. Yes. You cannot over, and especially when you see what Spock's biggest pain for his, in Star Trek V is. <laughs> that this is the healing of that big pain. It, yeah. It's so it's so well shot how Nimoy constructed that that shot of of Sarek and Spock staring at each other, and you get like those two profile views of their faces. And Mark Leonard and Leonard Nimoy look so much alike. That's actually why they got Mark Leonard to play Sarek yeah. was because you know he had been the Romulan commander, and they're like, hey, when the ears are on him, he looks a lot like Leonard. Like maybe <laughs> he could play his dad if we put some gray in his hair. Yeah. Um. And uh, so and and and. 
like I've said before, like Nimoy really cared about like the Spock stuff and the Vulcan stuff, and um, that yeah, it, it, that's kind of something that's just there for the fans who knew about the original series, who watched uh, Journey to Babel. Yeah. Um, then like that scene has like a big payoff. And I think if you didn't know that, at the very least, you would see that, you know, Spock is kind of back to normal and, you know, reconciles with a father who might not have approved of everything, <laughs> um, even though he hadn't been shown to be too disapproving. <laughs> um, but it's still a father-son scene, which is pretty emotionally yeah. satisfying. And I also believe we have some audience feedback. Some people have responded back to us with your thoughts on Star Trek IV. Uh, Dave, what do we have in the, the subspace transmissions? Sure. Um, first up, uh, I've got a tweet here from Star Trek for Life. Uh, he writes, uh, I think it was one of the most this, uh, most important of all the Star Trek stories. Uh, while we learned so much throughout the franchise about how much how we can change ourselves for the better, this one showed us the consequences of our poor decisions and taught us mm. all the value of all life. That's an interesting point. You yeah. actually get to sort of see through some through time travel the the effect of doing the wrong thing, yeah. and that wrong thing was actually we the audience. Uh, and he also has a follow up tweet where he says, uh, "I do think the humor still holds up. Uh, it gave uh, all of them a chance to shine in that regard too. The nuclear vessel scene was priceless, and that's true. That's iconic. Yeah. Uh, the mm -hmm. philosophical dis discussion between McCoy and Spock was classic banter." And the amazing pilot Sulu being stumped by windscreen wipers. Yeah. <laughs> and he's got the little head laughing <laughs> emojis. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's there's no doubt that the humor came through on a level, I don't know, is, is it, the timing is the best of any of the yes. movies, well, obviously. One yeah. thing I said last week about Star Trek Three, which I have a lot of fondness for, I said it's not as, it doesn't have like the memorable moments that mm -hmm. the Wrath of Khan has. Right. Um, it's got memorable, the, memorable lines instead. <laughs> And a, lot, a lot of lines from that movie that I uh, that I use in real life, apparently, yeah. but uh, that's just me being weird, I think. But uh, The Voyage Home definitely has memorable moments. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's part of its wide appeal. You know, people who generally uh, aren't that big of fans of Star Trek but have watched this movie remember this one. Yeah. Double dumbass on you. <laughs> <laughs> or Nuclear Wessels. Yeah. Nuclear Wessels is one of the most famous lines of Star Trek. It's like, you have like, the super iconics, like, like Live Long and Prosper... Uh, that you beam me up, um, that type of stuff. But then, like, like the next tier is yeah. going to have nuclear vessels. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, what, what else do we have? Uh, and then just a short comment here from someone who is Arky Guy. It says, as much as I love Star Trek Disco, I miss that optimism and lightheartedness in their stories. Um, so, so yeah, there's um. There, there's a different vibe here. Have they have they done any comedic episodes on disco yet? They haven't done like an entirely comedic episode. Although they've done the Harry Mutt, the first the, 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 the time second, travel, the second Harry, Harry Mutt. Yeah, yeah, that um, one was pretty light. Yeah, a lot of murder in it for a light story. Yeah, it was but that's dark disco. comedy, but it was very much a comedy episode. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, I, some of that, some of that optimism, at least, I think. Felt like it was more a part of Discovery season two for for me at least. Yeah. Um, but even there, we don't have something as fun and lighthearted as Star Trek Four. And like Brian said, I don't there's know, no plan in the waves with whales. Yeah, I, I no. don't. Know, I don't know if they would ever be able to do something like this again. Not as a movie, no. Maybe as a TV episode, we could get something like this. But I don't think. I mean, that said, the I, the the Kelvin movies, uh, especially the first one, but in, but in all of them, there's. Some pretty broad comedy in there. Maybe yeah. not always as successful as this, but some of it well, is. Well, no, I, as I said, they do copy the, the humor <laughs> level yeah. of, of, of Star Trek the, uh, 4. They, that they oh, we have to have quippy jokes. And they yeah. stick that in all the rest of the <laughs> yeah. Star Trek movies after this. Uh, a big part of the appeal of Star Trek to me is the flexibility of the franchise. And I think it has the ability to tell a wide variety of stories. Yeah. And so mm. I, I do love seeing... Uh, you know, Star Trek do the, the, the funny stuff and the lighthearted, optimistic stuff. Just as I like yeah. seeing it do, like, the action-heavy stuff or, like, the, the, the scary, spooky stuff or the, the, the yeah. really smart, cerebral-type stuff. I, you know, I, think, I, think it, I think it can do a lot. I think the Berman era started to die when they started saying, no, that's not a Star Trek story too many times. Hmm. It's interesting. Hmm. You know, well, also, speaking of humor, when the uh, the Lower Decks premieres, and maybe when the other animated series premieres, yeah. we'll also get to see if they can carry that in. I hope humor doesn't get relegated to the animated shows that they do remember to bring it <laughs> bring it up. But, you know, that first Picard teaser uh, had him uh, given the uh, side-eye to the guy well, for I, not knowing who he was, so... I, I don't 
I don't <laughs> think the uh, well that that wasn't in the teaser. That was in the leaked footage from the CBS upfronts, but. Still was funny. Yeah. It still um, points to a, a funner sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so I don't, I don't know if we'll get much comedy in Star Trek Picard, but it's certainly possible. But yeah, Lower Decks might be the show that will scratch that itch for you if, if uh, you're wanting more Star Trek for less uh, dark, gritty discovery. Yep. Uh, so that's, that's something to look forward to on the horizon. Uh, but yeah, that's all we have for Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. We will, of course, be back next week to discuss uh, the incredibly popular, beloved <laughs> Star Trek V The Final Frontier, directed by cinematic genius William Shatner. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll see you then. I, I know you, you can't wait, and uh, we'll be anticipating uh, Sunday all week long. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll sign off for now, but until then... Live Live long long and and prosper, y'all! Thank all of you so much for checking out this installment of Text Trek. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Please be sure to like our YouTube videos and subscribe to our channel. Uh, Audio-only version of episodes are available on our website, www.text-trek.com. Please check out our site, especially if you just want an audio-only podcast. Uh, We have that available for you. Y'all can also keep up with us online. You can follow us on Twitter, at TXTrek, or you can uh, check us out on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash text-trek. Please, by all means, let us know what you think by dropping a comment anywhere you see fit. Uh, We definitely want to hear your feedback. Let us know what you liked and what you would like to see more of what you would like to see differently going forward. If you want to email me directly, uh, go ahead. I can be reached at fatheryactual at text-trek.com. Thank all y'all again. Take care.